Uh, it's a great turnout. We didn't expect this many people, so we're a, a little little strapped for chairs. But we're going to go ahead and get started here. I think uh, in in, uh, in a minute or so. Uh, my name is Tim Provo, and I'm the president of the board of directors for Footloose Montana, and we're the organization that's putting on this workshop today. Um, where, in case anybody noticed the cameras in the back, we have people both from uh, MCAT and KPACS in the back that are uh, going to film everything that we're doing here today. Um, sort of the, the way we're going to run this today in terms of, of different sections, uh, I'm going to talk for a couple minutes about Footloose Montana as an organization. Uh, I'm going to give a hopefully brief little presentation here on trapping in Montana and the, the problems that it poses for our state. And then uh, we're fortunate to have Dr. Schaumburg from the Prime Veterinary Clinic here with us, who's going to talk for a few minutes about uh, basic uh, canine and I assume maybe feline first aid. Uh, it was backcountry, so I didn't expect many cats to go to back. Okay, predominantly backcountry canine first aid. Uh, <laughs> and then after that, uh, Ted, standing back there in the corner of the room, is going to. Uh, teach everybody uh, about the different types of traps you're likely to encounter in Montana and most importantly how they operate and how you can release your companion animal from one of those devices okay so at the end of the day our goals uh, today when you leave when you walk out of the building today our hope is that you'll have a broader and clearer understanding of the problems trapping poses across the state of Montana that you'll have a comfortable working knowledge of these trapping devices how they work you're able to recognize them and most importantly uh, that you have the basic skills to quickly and safely release your animal from one of these devices administer whatever basic first aid is necessary and then quickly transport your animal to uh, definitive veterinary medical care okay so a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to sort of get going with things. It looks like we have a great crowd of people today. Uh, we've done a number of these workshops uh, over the years across the state, um, and they are always open to the public. Um, in the past, unfortunately, uh, historically, we get uh, usually a number of members of the trapping community that uh, show up to attend the workshops which in and of itself is great. They're more than welcome to be here, more than welcome to ask questions, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not trying to exclude anybody. What has traditionally happened, unfortunately, is uh, those individuals tend to be a bit uh, aggressive, very confrontational, very disruptive. Uh, at times, they've tried to sort of participate in the teaching section of things and then use that as a platform uh, to put forth pro-trapping propaganda, uh, none of which is really going to be acceptable here today for obvious reasons. So my humble and polite request is that everybody please just uh, be polite. Uh, I'm certainly not suggesting that anybody from the trapping community needs to sit there and be quiet and not say anything. Far from it. If anyone has questions, please ask. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, but you know, when if things get tense and confrontational, everything sort of deteriorates. And at the end of the day, the people that suffer the most are the people that are here trying to learn these things, okay? So um, if there are people here that disagree or oppose what we're doing, that's fine. Please try and remain polite and cooperative, and uh, let's try and do a lot of teaching today, okay? So enough on that. Let's get things started here. Uh, as I said, uh, our organization is called Footloose Montana, and we are a official nonprofit organization, a statewide organization, uh, whose mission is dedicated to promoting the idea of trap-free public lands across the state of Montana. Uh, we do this predominantly through numerous education and outreach efforts across the state, uh, such as this workshop that we have here today. Okay? Uh, we are registered with the IRS as an official 501c3 organization, a tax-exempt organization. Uh, what that means for anyone that wants to support us is of course, if you uh, want to make a donation to us today, that's tax deductible. You can claim that on your income tax return. Um, anyone that's followed the trapping movement in the last five or s probably five to eight years in Montana uh, is probably aware of some of the uh, political efforts and political activities that, that have gone on in the past. Um, I, if time allows, I'll address some of that a little bit later. Uh, as a nonprofit organization, Footloose itself is very limited by the IRS in what we can do in terms of political lobbying or political action efforts due to the fact that we collect tax-free or tax-exempt money. Uh, so when it's time for political action, 
uh, members of our sort of larger organization uh, form different political action committees or ballot initiative committees to pursue the direct political action to try to get the laws changed in the state. Um, and as I said, if there's time, we'll talk a little bit about some of that stuff later. Uh, but the, the focus of this little talk today, uh, as I said, is to try and give you a clear and sort of broader view of what trapping is really about and the problems that it poses for Montana. When we first started doing these workshops, we were uh, routinely amazed at the number of people that would come in and go, my God, I had no idea that this went on at all in Montana or anywhere in the world today. Uh, so not only did people not know it, that, that it was going on, people were really, really unaware of the problems uh, associated with it in our state. So let's see if I can make some of these things work. The power cords here, okay. Thanks, Laura, if it, uh, the battery's running okay, if it's gonna run out, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and switch it over. I'm, I think I'll stand right here. Um, so we're gonna talk about traps today. Um, I pulled a couple of photos off here of uh, trapping sites or, or, or trap sets, uh, just to give you an idea of how difficult these things are to see in the wild. I think a number of people get a false sense of security when they hike in the woods with their dogs. I think, oh, if, I, you know, if we stumble across one of those devices, I'm gonna be able to see it. Um, anyone see the trap in that picture? Uh, I certainly can't. I've never been able to find it. I think it's most likely uh, a leg hold trap that's buried somewhere in this area under the dirt. Um, and I, before I go too much further, I, I wanna give one more disclaimer. Um, I, I've got a lot of photographic evidence in this little slideshow here. Some of the stuff is very disturbing. It's not easy to look at, okay? Uh, my intention is not to shock or distress anybody. I'm a firm believer in the old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. And I could stand here for a week and talk to you guys about some of the problems associated with trapping and I'm never gonna get my point across as clearly or as effectively as I am by showing you a couple bits of photographic evidence of, of what this practice is all about. Um, if anybody wants to close your eyes, turn your chair around, leave the room, I promise you I'm not gonna be offended, okay? Uh, this stuff is not easy to look at, it's not easy for me to look at, it's not easy for me to sort through and put together into hopefully coherent presentations, um, but I just, I, I, my intention is not to spring anything on you or, or to shock anybody, okay? So uh, these first couple of pictures aren't bad. I don't want anybody on the edge of their seat yet. Um, here's another typical wild area. Uh, that one's a little bit easier to see. That's a snare device that's been placed most likely along a game trail, an area that your dog, if he was off leash, would, uh, yes. yes. Uh, yeah, I can't, my remote's not working, so. Oh, sure, is this better over here? Okay, wish this fancy little gadget here would work, but it doesn't want to. Okay, yeah, it doesn't want to work today. Okay, um, there's another snare trap that is, again, most likely put on a game trail. Again, something your dog would very easily and very readily, pardon? Sure. See that little thin, wire circle in the middle yeah and if you were just walking along say you know a perpendicular trail and glanced over uh, you'd never see that which is uh, probably yeah that's I, I don't know what this is set for uh, my guess is well it could be set for any number of animals but yeah it's going to be set at a height such that as the animal goes along he's going to uh, stick his head in it and it's going to tighten it that has as well as Ted will show us in a little while these most of these are equipped with a one-way uh, swivel or ratcheting device that will uh, progressively tighten and tighten down as the animal struggles more and more and eventually uh, strangle it to death. Okay, that one's a little bit easier to see, uh, but again, if you're walking along enjoying the great outdoors, uh, that's not something that's readily going to jump out to you uh, as you see it. Um, this is not a very scary looking picture. This is probably the most feared type of trap you're going to encounter uh, in Montana, and this is called a conibear trap. And uh, they're not very intuitive devices just looking at them and they're extremely hard to explain just based on a picture. But um, one of our trapping experts, Ted, back here in the corner is uh, gonna explain a little more and we've got some of these devices that um, are back here on the table and we're gonna have a chance to get, let everybody uh, get their hands on them. Uh, and the one that's set up right now is loaded. <laughs> All the safety catches are on it, but uh, Milo, make sure nobody reaches over and <laughs> picks that up, please. We definitely don't want that. We don't want that on the evening news. That wouldn't, uh, no. Um, okay, so uh, these devices uh, come in varying sizes 
and when they are, so these are almost always baited in the woods, and when an animal of an appropriate size gets in one, this is what happens, okay? And that red fox is quite dead uh, with a broken neck. Hopefully the broken neck happened quickly and that, that, that animal died with a minimum of suffering. Um, if one of your dogs is unfortunate enough to get caught in one of these devices, this is what happens, okay? This is a large conibear trap, probably what they call a 330, I would guess. This dog is a Rottweiler, okay, a full-grown Rottweiler, and unfortunately he's quite dead in this picture. Um, as you can see, he's got uh, anyone that is familiar with the breed knows they have a pretty large skull, a pretty large, thick, muscular neck, um, and this thing quite easily killed this dog. Uh, this bar, it's a little hard to see from this picture, but these bars running across here, uh, driven by two sets of these springs we see right here, uh, clamped down in parallel with an incredible amount of crushing force. Uh, this dog's upper jaw, his maxilla, and uh, upper dentition are clearly fractured. Um, uh, Dr. Schomburg could probably speak b better on this than I could, but just looking at the way his eye seems distorted and swollen, my guess is he's probably got some sort of a frontal skull fracture um, as well in this picture. Um, this is what these devices will do to your dogs um, in the woods. Uh, the hope is... Is that a legal set? I don't think so. A uh, legally uh, set trap. This one, uh, this one was most likely... Illegally set trap. Okay. Yeah, it, I, this one I believe was legally set. Um, you know, we can spend a lot of time talking about the legality or illegality of where these are set. Uh, the bottom line is we have countless incidents in which these things are illegally set uh, and kill dogs on land. It, it, it happens all the time. What's the numbers uh, of that where those traps are killing dogs? We have, well, how many, Anya? Between 15 and 30? No, no, no. Um, the total only this season um, is 21 <coughs> dogs that were injured in traps, mostly set on public lands. So 21 dogs and two cats. But not in those traps. In traps. In traps, including snares, uh, mostly neck hole traps and snares. Yeah. That we know of. Yeah. That we know of. Well, sure. I mean, if, if, if somebody wants to debate how many of these scenarios are okay, that's, that, that's up to you. Okay, so uh, the big question that all this begs is what's wrong with trapping in Montana? Um, for ease, I've sort of broken this down into four little main subcategories. Uh, this really isn't going to be a super long presentation. Hopefully no one is thinking, oh my God, he's breaking it down into subcategories. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to be here all afternoon. Um, unfortunately, you know, this is a difficult topic to cover really quickly. Uh, if, if you're talking to somebody on the street corner or you're talking to a colleague over the water cooler at work, this really isn't something, this problem you can't adequately explain uh, in, in 15 seconds. It, it just, it's just not possible. Um, and unfortunately, the trapping community uh, is, does a very good job of coming up with what I like to call little five second sound bites. Uh, and I'm of the opinion that in our busy, busy society today, if you can package something into a five second sound bite uh, that sounds good and sounds convincing, you don't, it doesn't have to be true and you don't have to have anything to back it up. You can sell it to people easily. You can, you can give that to somebody in five seconds on the street corner, they go home with it and go, you know what, that sounds great, I'm gonna buy into that, and, and they're done. They're done with that topic and they've moved on with their life. Um, unfortunately, the, the truth is a little more lengthy and a little more complicated. So we're going to just very briefly cover these topics. Uh, I, as people that have heard me talk before can attest, I can talk all day long on any one of these topics, but in the interest of time and uh, taking pity on everybody, I'm not going to subject you to all of that. So uh, let's sort of briefly go through these. Um, sorry, I should probably go back. I didn't, I rattled on and on and didn't really cover this slide. Uh, the, the trapping issue can sort of easily be broken down into conservation implications, financial implications, public land use implications, and of course cruelty or ethical implications. And we'll start with looking at conservation. Here are the common claims that you're going to hear from the pro-trapping community across Montana. Trapping is an eff effective and essential wildlife management tool. Trapping is important to control the spread of animal-borne diseases across the state. 
Trapping is a necessary tool to control various predator populations across the state, and trapping is a necessary tool to control or mitigate damage from certain species, uh, the most common example being uh, beavers. Here are the facts. There is absolutely no evidence that trapping is a necessary or effective wildlife management tool, and we're going to get to a couple reasons uh, why that's the case here in a minute. There is very, very strong and very clear evidence in the scientific literature that trapping does not affect, uh, is not an effective tool to manage the spread of animal-borne diseases in the wild. There are many predator species, the most common and well-known <coughs> example being the coyote, that will vary their litter size in response to external pressures. And what that means is the more coyotes you kill and the lower you try and drive the population, the larger the litter size has become, and vice versa. And anyone that, that has been in Montana for any length of time knows uh, we kill a lot of coyotes in Montana. And I'm not passing judgment on that. That's not what we're doing. I'm just saying that that's a fact. We trap, we shoot, we kill coyotes as often as we can. Has anyone ever gotten the impression that we're running out of coyotes in Montana, that it's having any sort of a positive or useful impact? Of course not. Uh, when you look at the claim that uh, trapping beaver is necessary because uh, their dam building activities and logging activities are terribly damaging and cause all et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it's simply not true. Uh, I've done some extensive internet searching for uh, documented cases of severe property damage personal injury, death, et cetera, from these so-called beaver dam disasters, um, and it, it's just not out there. Uh, it is just not out there. My search went back, I think, 150 years in U.S. history, and I found three examples uh, of a major uh, beaver dam breakage and anything that would meet the definition of a catastrophic property damage or loss of life. It, it, it's clearly over-exaggerated. And if you spend any time looking at the uh, ecological benefits of beaver activity, what their dam building actually does. Uh, the, the creation of riparian zones that serve as important breeding and feeding grounds for many, many large species in Montana, including our beloved elk populations. And you look at what beaver dam activity can do in terms of contributing to the overall water table in Montana, which would produce more fresh water for, for, for people to use would produce an infinitely larger supply of water for uh, agricultural and ranching irrigation in the eastern part of the state. Um, it's just amazing. And if you, do, if, if you read into this at all, you very quickly begin to ask yourself, why in the world would we want to kill any of these animals, given all the, all the benefits that they have to offer uh, our environment here in the state? Whoops, sorry, I went a little too fast here. Uh, here are a couple other facts that speak to um, <coughs> speak to the fact that uh, trapping is not an effective or, or useful wildlife management tool. There's no limit to the number of traps any individual trapper can set in Montana. There's no required trap check period, meaning you can set a trap and go check it the next day, the next week, the next month. You can decide, I'm never going to go back and check that trap. Uh, despite the claims that you'll hear, these devices are completely nonspecific. Any animal of even remotely similar size that gets into that device uh, in all likelihood is going to be caught, injured, and or killed in it. So if, if you look at this sort of uncontrolled, unregulated approach to this, uh, you very quickly begin to ask yourself, well, what, what's, how can this, not only does this not seem like a wildlife management tool, what sort of negative impact it, could this be having not only on the targeted species, but the non-targeted species and our endangered species in the state? So the, when we posed this question a couple years ago, we first went to the trapping community and asked them that very thing. Uh, their answer was literally a shrug of the shoulders. They said, we don't know. We don't keep track of any of that stuff. FWP does all that. And if there was a problem, they'd let us know. And at first glance, we said, OK, that seems like a pretty reasonable answer. Let's go talk to Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. We went to Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and imagine our astonishment when the answer we got was essentially the same thing. It was a shrug of the shoulders and they said, we don't know. And we said, well, what, what, are, what, what are your studies on population numbers of any of these species showing? We don't know, we don't do that. Well, what about viability studies? How healthy are these species? We don't do any of that. So you very quickly begin to realize that we have a situation in Montana of the blind leading the blind. FWP says, go out, trap, and kill as many as you can. 
And the trappers say, well, okay, that's what we're going to do. And if there's a problem, fish, and, fish, wildlife, and parks will stop us. No one's paying attention. No one's paying attention. Say something real quick. You can. That, yeah. Um, that, I'm sorry, but that is just what you're telling these people is not true. The trapping is the most regulated um, thing out there in terms of hunting. And uh, I want to say one other thing is that uh, there is a lot of information collected about the sensitive species that are trapped. And we and, and there's all kinds of data. We, they take sex data, age data, and they use that to set their quota systems for these species. And then when the quota is met for a particular species, say bobcat, it is closed. It is closed in a 24-hour notice. So to say it is unregulated and, that, and, and to say that there is no statistics on the animals that are trapped is a bold-faced lie. Well, I, I, I beg to differ with you, sir. The information you're putting forth, uh, I, I, I would posit, is, is incorrect. Now, I don't know if you've been misled or if you're intentionally trying. Look, we're, we're not gonna get, I'm not going to get dragged into, into a side debate here, okay? You and I can agree to disagree right now. I'm confident in the things I'm saying. I've got information to back it up. You can disagree with me. We can discuss it later or at, on another date in a public forum. I'm happy to do that. Oh, I, that that's fine. And I, I, you know, we can have the discussion after the workshop on the next slide. Well, okay, no. let's, let's move. Well, wait a in, second. In, so in in your point, you know, for me, no, 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 let's just go this. this is going to continue on, or you're going to go out the door, man. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's fine, but I just want to say yeah, that you are not able to do the job myself. No, ever look. This was a disclaimer I tried to put forth at the beginning. This is this is how things always go. I, you're entitled to your opinion. I'm happy to listen to it. Um, if you and I, if if you and I take a lot of time to debate this point right now, we're not going to have time for the workshop, and that's that's the main reason we're here. Okay, I'm. I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss it later. Um, if, if the Montana Trappers Association or you or anybody wants to set up a public debate on the issue, uh, I, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, I'm, don't get the impression I'm trying to shut you down or shove you out the door or something. I'm not. I'm just okay. You're 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 welcome. You're welcome to raise your point. Okay. May I ask a valid question? All the questions are valid today. What does one pay to get a license? kill as many animals as you want. If you're going to trap fur bear species in Montana, is it $40 it's for a $29. license? Okay. And if you're going to trap predator species, you don't require any license no at all. License is that no Okay. No. Okay. Well, let, let, let's keep things moving. I've got a not I keep saying I have a short presentation, but it's going to get long if we don't move along. Um, one final very interesting note, um, if you compare the number of trapping licenses sold in a given time period versus current fur prices for that same time period, uh, guess what you get? You get a direct correlation. Okay, You get more or less a straight line, uh, which means again that this is being done for personal profit and or enjoyment and it's not some sort of essential wildlife management tool. If it was, they'd be out there trapping in, in some sort of uh, I, what's, I don't know what word I want. Yeah, in some sort of scheduled system or something. Uh, you, don't, uh, you, you don't manage wildlife based on fur prices. Okay, uh, this is Brian Giddings, who's the fur bear coordinator for Montana FWP. And this is sort of an interesting quote that he gave to our executive director a couple years ago. Uh, and everybody can read this for themselves. I won't go through and read it. Um, Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. Uh, neither FWP nor I have made claims that there is scientific information that addresses the relationship between recreational trapper harvest and disease control. FWP regulates fur bear trapping seasons for recreational harvest opportunities. Montana's harvest seasons are not based on reducing or controlling diseases. Okay. FWP regulates fur bear trapping seasons for recreational harvest opportunities. Okay, this is a recreational sport done for profit. It is not a wildlife management tool, and that is, I guess, straight from the straight from the top. Brian Giddings, as far as I know, is still the fur bear coordinator, the guy in charge of everything on uh, fish and games <laughs> end of things. Okay, these are just a couple of photographs of a, uh, of of a 
of a trapper's take over the season. And the only reason I'm putting this in here is just to sort of give you an idea of how many animals somebody can take in a season. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty astounding. Okay, and uh, one of our more vocal opponents from down uh, in the Bitterroot, and this is not him in the picture, by the way, this is a different picture. Uh, Dennis Foothold Schutz says, we are by far the most proficient harvesters out there. We are only limited by the amount of sets we make in a day. Okay, that's not a typical way to describe a wildlife management strategy. Okay, let's move on. The financial aspects of trapping. The common claim you're going to hear. Trapping brings in valuable revenue to Montana. The facts are, and this data is a couple years old, I think it's from 2009, but it, it, it still holds. Uh, in, in the year we collected this, Montana brought in approximately $80,000 from trapping licensing fees in the state. And that's true, that's money that comes into the state. If you bear in mind, however, that Fish, Wildlife, and Parks maintains an entire fur bearers division, okay, with Brian Giddings as the head, he has however many employees under him he has, all of whom, of course, require a salary, a benefits package, office space, equipment, perhaps a vehicle, et cetera. Pardon? And a pickup. And a pickup. Uh, you very quickly realize that that budget is going to far exceed $80,000 a year. So right off the bat, that, that claim is invalid and, and trapping does not bring in any sort of net profit to the state. Uh, it gets a little more disturbing if you start to contemplate the revenue stream that comes into Montana every year in the terms of wildlife watching revenue. And that is essentially the money, tourism dollars that come into our state from people around the country and around the world. They come here to see big sky country. Uh, see our wild areas and see our wildlife. And the, the, uh, we've gotten a couple of different federal estimates. Uh, the one, uh, there were a couple that are lower and a couple that are bigger than this. Uh, this one is $500 million a year. Every estimate I've seen is in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Now, if you start to think as, as, as the public focus on trapping gets bigger and bigger, and as the impact on our environment from trapping gets bigger and bigger, uh, what's gonna happen to this revenue stream? Are people still going to spend their money to come here and see animals that aren't there anymore? When people around the world or around the country uh, not only learn how animals are treated here in the wild, but more importantly, they learn how we allow them to be treated, how likely are they going to be to come here to Montana to participate in that or see that and spend their money here? Okay? It's kind of a disturbing question, especially in these economic times. Uh, the analysis that would be needed to try and answer that question is obviously way beyond the scope uh, of a group like ours, uh, but we keep saying this loud and clearly in the hopes that uh, the governor and or the legislature is going to sit up and take notice and start to go, you know, maybe we should take a look at this. So uh, public land use. Uh, this is a public land use issue. Uh, what we're talking about today happens on private and public land, of course. Uh, we are not in a position, nor do we feel we have any right to try and dictate what people do on their private land. Uh, I'm a taxpayer. I assume everyone here is a taxpayer. We all have a right to say what does or does not occur on our public lands. And the common claims that you'll hear in this regard are, trapping is a right. You can't take away my right to trap. You can't tell us what to do on public land. And my personal favorite, if you don't like trapping, go somewhere else. So. <laughs> Despite the fact that I've lived in Montana for uh, the better part of 12 years, worked and paid taxes here that entire time, I'm very commonly told. I'm always told to go back to California. I've never lived in California. <laughs> I don't have any desire to live there, but that's uh, nonetheless. <laughs> uh, here are the facts. Trapping is not a right, of course, as defined by Montana's Constitution. Uh, approximately one-third of the land mass in Montana is public land. Uh, there are, based on the number of licenses sold, approximately, and this, again, this data is a couple years old, but I think still valid, uh, approximately 4,000 trapping licenses sold. Uh, if you do some rough math, that comes out to approximately 0.4%. Less than one half of 1% of Montana's population is essentially holding our, our public lands hostage, okay? Because of what 0.4% of the population do on our public lands, you all have to be here today spending your Saturday afternoon with me, listening to me, uh, to, to learn how to avoid these problems, okay? Uh, and the final segment of the story is the cruelty issue. And this is where it gets difficult, guys. Um, and there is just no way to simply put this in words 
uh, and, and get the point across as to how, how unethical and unimaginable uh, some of this stuff is. Okay, uh, this is not a real bad photo. This coyote's caught in a leg hold trap. Um, and incidentally, uh, virtually all of uh, the information that I have here and all the photographic evidence uh, is available online. Uh, and if anyone wants to, I'll be happy to direct you to some of these websites. Uh, for reasons I've never quite understood, uh, when a lot of trappers catch these animals, they want to take photographs of them uh, before they kill them. Now, this guy's actually having a photograph of him taking, taking a photograph, but nonetheless, um, okay. Uh, that's a raccoon that's caught. I can't, he's got a injured paw. I don't know if he's in a, I assume he's in a leg hold trap. I can't see it in there. Um, I, I guess he could have been caught in a snare, but it, it doesn't really look like it. Um, and again, this guy's moving in. Uh, in all likelihood, to beat this animal to death, uh, he may have a gun in his hand. If this animal's fortunate, uh, this individual has a firearm in his hand and is going to kill him quickly. Uh, and again, he has a, a presumably a trapping partner or someone behind him uh, taking a picture of the whole thing. Um, and incidentally, th these are posted on trapping interest websites. Uh, they proudly post all of this, all these pictures on there. Um, and there's some pretty shocking commentary and conversation uh, threads that, that go along with it. So um, this is a raccoon that's been caught in a leg hold trap in the water. His fur is all wet, so of course it's lost all of its insulating ability. Um, and I put this quote up here because it seems to go well with this photograph. Uh, uh, the philosopher Jeremy Bentham, the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but rather can they suffer? And unfortunately, the answer to that question is yes, that they can. And again, uh, our very vocal opponent, Mr. Schutz, from the Bitterroot says, I will apologize to no one for being a trapper. We trappers do cause pain and suffering to animals and apologize to no one. Um, I'll give him credit for being honest. We don't hear anyone quite that honest about this issue very often, uh, but he is uh, speaking the truth. Okay. Uh, this is one of the worst slides I've come across, and believe me, I've come across a lot of bad evidence. Uh, this is a coyote that was caught um, in uh, two traps at once. I, I think this is maybe called a double set. I'm not exactly sure. It uh, doesn't really matter. Um, you often hear about animals uh, chewing off one of their own limbs to escape a trap. Uh, that is rather flippantly referred to as a ring off by the trapping community. Uh, this poor animal attempted to do that with one of his limbs and he chewed the wrong end off. Chewed the end off that was on the wrong side of the trap. Uh, when the guy that created this situation came by, uh, he took a picture of it and then he posted a comment online and looking at this scenario, the only thing that this individual could think of to say was, those padded 650s, which are these traps, are sweet. I'm padding my last dozen this weekend. Um, it, 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 it sort of defies reason. I spent probably the first year I was in this organization, I wasted a lot of my own time and effort uh, trying to figure out the thought process and what, I guess, what made, what, what made trappers tick for, for lack, I mean, not trying to be overly dramatic, uh, and I couldn't do it. I, I have never been able to wrap my mind around uh, a scenario like this or come to any understanding. And when you hear people talk about compromise, people go, well, you should compromise with the trappers. Everything's a compromise. Sit down at a table and compromise. How do you compromise on this? Is this okay to do once a week? Is this okay to do to our wildlife part of the year, every other Tuesday? We'll only do this to a certain number of animals? I, wh where's, where, how, how do you compromise on this? Okay. Uh, here's another Montana trapper from the Montana Fur Bear Conservation Alliance. And again, you'll see a lot of these pro-trapping organizations uh, have these big sort of comforting and, and rather misleading names. Uh, Montana Fur Bear Conservation Alliance. Sounds like an organization that's doing some good for Montana, right? Uh, and Mr. Bothwell's concern is uh, that trapping needs to, uh, tends to get painted in a pretty negative light it's because people don't understand what trapping is all about. Well, by the end of today, guys, you're going to understand what it's all about, okay? Uh, this little guy was I can't quite tell if that's, I don't know what kind of trap that that's in. Yeah, no, I don't know what kind of trap he's caught in. Um, is that a conner bear? Okay, yeah, I guess those are. Um, and he's clearly uh, broken off a tooth trying to bite his way out of there. Uh, this was taken by a Montana trapper, and uh, again, the only thing that came to mind was he's not a happy camper. Okay, another Missoula trapper quote, I check my mountain line once a week, okay? So this individual sets traps, 
up in the mountains and comes back a week later to trap them. So if this poor guy is unfortunate enough to get caught in one of his devices on day one, uh, he has six to seven days to try and survive uh, in that snow uh, against exposure, hypothermia, predation, et cetera, before someone's going to come along uh, and kill him. Uh, and again, Mr. Bothwell says, uh, what it's about is an opportunity for those of us that harvest coyotes to demonstrate our skills and do it in a friendly, competitive manner. Doesn't sound so bad, does it? Okay. Well, there are the skills demonstrated in a friendly and competitive manner. Okay. And guys, these are not some rare, weird slides I pulled out of nowhere. Okay. I mean, these are, I put these in here because they are representative of what goes on. Okay. The, the, these are not the exceptions to the rules. Okay, and this poor, uh, d despite being uh, held in uh, what looks like some sort of a catch pole device, uh, this coyote has both, uh, was unfortunate enough to get both front feet caught uh, in one leg hole trap. Okay, uh, this fox, you can't tell what he's caught in. I assume it's a leg hole trap. You can't really see it right there. Um, and, and again, I, I've given up trying to figure any of the psychology out behind any of this. In addition to posing with the animal before they kill it. Uh, a lot of these guys often pose with the blunt instrument they're going to beat the animal to death with uh, after the picture's taken, which is why this gentleman has um, a softball bat in his hand. And that's why this guy didn't want to be in the picture, but he wanted his aluminum softball bat in the picture. So uh, he got that in the picture there. And Mr. Bothwell, one more time, the trap is designed to hold by pressure and friction. They're not designed to break bones. Um, you can see this paw caught in here. You can see this edge up here with the two edges uh, of this trap close together. Um, I don't know if that animal's limb is broken or not, but it sure doesn't look comfortable. Do you know how old a man this Bothworth is? Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't. As far as I know, I haven't early met him. 60s? Pardon? I think, yes. Okay. Early 60s. Maybe around 60s. Uh, and uh, this gray fox, and again, it's hard to tell. It, was, it, it caught in something and ended up wrapping himself kind of around this log right here and uh, the trapper said got this gray this morning and saw a thousand yoke tracks all around the set could hear air wheezing out of his lungs from being bitten but he was still very much alive so this animal sat out all night and fell victim to predation from other animals um, and unfortunately didn't die from it and uh, so again oh I'm sorry sure I, I'm, it's kind of hard to see through me isn't it And again, I, this is, I think this is, Don says a lot of stuff that we capture and like to put on here. Um, once they figure out that they can't move, they struggle for a bit, but once they figure out, hey, I can't go anywhere, what the heck, they just take a nap. Um, it's amazing that they would both think anyone is going to buy into that, but um, again, okay. Uh, you'll hear a lot of the trapping community talk about how specific the traps are, and we don't get non-target catches. Uh, and I'm not even talking about non-target mammalian catches, okay? You know, you're after a fisher and you catch, you know, some other fur bear or vice versa. Folks, this is a fish that's in one of these devices, okay? You, 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 you can't fish with traps in Montana. This is a duck, okay? And again, these are just, again, to illustrate the point, these devices are completely non-specific. Uh, you'll hear trappers talk a lot about the respect that they have for the wildlife that they pursue. Um, I put this picture in here because to me, this doesn't necessarily scream respect, uh, okay? Uh, you, don't, you, you, you don't create this situation and then uh, have your son or someone's son pose in this manner behind the animal and take a picture of it before you beat it to death. It, you, you don't do that. that that's not, it doesn't meet any definition of respect that I've ever heard. Uh, this is a long quote. I don't want to go through all of it. Um, uh, it's basically talking about uh, trapping raccoons and how uh, you can set up drowning sets so that these animals will drown underwater or depending on the temperature of the water the raccoon will die from hypothermia even if he doesn't drown. Uh, so again with, with, with some of these devices and some of these setups the intention is for them to die from drowning or from exposure. 
Uh, this coyote on top uh, clearly is dead. Uh, the one on the bottom is alive. I don't think this one I, I was initially caught in a cage trap simply because his front left limb appears to be injured. He's in a cage right now. Uh, you'll hear a lot of people say, well, okay, maybe everything you say is true, but cage trapping is okay. These, they're, they're caught in big cages. They're not hurting those cages, and then everything is apparently okay. Uh, far from it. Okay. These are other coyotes that were live trapped, either in cages or they may have been caught in leg hold traps um, and, then, and then taken alive. Uh, here's a few more. They look real happy, don't they? Uh, here's a gentleman that has uh, one of his live trap coyotes that he's trying to uh, force around with what's called a catch pole. This is a, a, a hollow pole, has a cable that runs down it to a noose on the end. You put the noose around the animal's neck, pull tight, and then the animal pretty much is under your control. Um, live trap coyotes are used for this. They're used for dog baiting, to train hunting dogs. Oh, I'm sorry, sure. Okay, and again, okay. Okay, so this is what live trapping coyotes is all about. Okay. And, and since we are, uh, since we're concerned about respect for the animals after we finish this, we line them up, we take a picture, and we drink a case of beer. And I like to talk, but quite frankly, a lot of these don't need any commentary. Uh, they just really don't. Okay, so uh, that's the end of the presentation. I thank everybody for their attention. Um, if you're having trouble sleeping tonight, you can certainly blame it on me. Um, next, we're going to hear from our veterinarian, Dr. Uh, Schomburg. Or, okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I talked so long, I, I blanked out on your name. My apologies. Um, we're going to hear about some first aid, and then we're going to uh, get our hands on some of these devices and learn uh, how to operate them. Thank you for your attention. I'm not a professional speaker. I was just asked to uh, uh, come talk to you about uh, first aid, and I thought just for dogs in the backcountry. And so I've just got a little bit of a talk, and uh, I'll uh, also address, because I uh, recognize that this is a uh, footloose meeting, we'll talk about some trapping injuries and some of the first aid specific to traps, but the majority... Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. All right. <laughs> So I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, basic first aid for your dog uh, in the backcountry. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, um, the injuries that you can get from trapping. I've learned some about uh, the differences in traps. I was familiar with leg hold traps and some with snares, not so much the conibear or whatever uh, that one is called. But uh, uh, we do see a number of injuries from uh, leg hold traps. Uh, primarily in the veterinary clinic every year. Um, snares I don't see um, and maybe that's because either they're able to release the pet or the pet doesn't come into the veterinary clinic after getting in uh, some of these others. Um, but talking about first aid in the in the backcountry, uh, the main thing that I want to get across is um, that everybody just needs to be prepared they need to be practiced and they need to be practical. And I'm gonna bring up being practical a lot. Uh, there's a lot of different species of dogs and a lot of different personalities and a lot of different skill sets in the owners and what you can do uh, as far as first aid will have to be taken into consideration for the big picture. Um, everybody who goes into the back country with or without a pet should have a first aid kit. And it should be a first aid kit that's commensurate with what your knowledge and your skill sets are. Um, and so what you feel comfortable using is what you need to take. I'm going to ask that if you're going with a pet, that you add some vet wrap and you add some additional padding that you might not use on yourself. Vet wrap really is a good bandage even for yourself, however. Um, and so it's, it's a good thing to add to your kit. 
Also like to emphasize, this is not a first aid class. This is just a, a discussion about first aid in the backcountry, and everybody should take a first aid class for themselves and for their pet. The things that you learn in a first aid class are all gonna be geared towards people. A lot of that, if you use common sense, can be applied to your pet. You do have to take into consideration the differences in <coughs> anatomy and uh, um, use that uh, with common sense. Um, I'm also gonna throw out something that maybe none of you have thought about, that you should practice with your dog. Um, if you can't lay your dog on his side and pour cold water on the inside of the thigh trying to clean a pretend wound because he's just not going to tolerate it, you're not going to be able to treat and wash that kind of a wound in the backcountry. Um, if you're not able to wrap uh, a, a normal dog's leg with uh, some kind of a bandage at home, you're going to know your dog after you try. You're going to see what kind of behavior he's going to have. It's going to change the way you handle your backcountry emergency. You're not going to spend the time trying to bandage a wound when you know that on a calm, uninjured pet at home, he's not going to put up with it or she's not going to put up with it. And so you're going to take different action. You're going to try and get the, the pet to help rather than spending the time uh, trying to apply first aid. Even though you may be a first responder um, and know and have equipment for you know, a high level of first aid, if your dog's not gonna tolerate it, there's no point in, in stressing him out further and trying to make things worse. Um, so I'm going to suggest that you practice with your dog at home. You just s take some time, take some bandage materials, try and wash a fake wound, um, do it in different parts of the body um, and just try some different uh, things where everything is calm and peaceful. It gives your dog experience. It gives you experience. Once your dog thinks this is a game we've played before, then when you're cleaning the wound in the back country, it's still a game we've played before and it goes a lot easier. So I'm going to suggest that you try that. I'm going to uh, emphasize that you don't wrestle, you don't struggle, you don't take three of you and try and get something done because you think that's the best way to do it. You can likely make things worse. Just go for help, uh, whatever the, the situation uh, needs to be. Um, situations where you have traps or uh, something of that nature, you can come across a dog that you're totally unfamiliar with. That's gonna be a dog that's in a very painful, very scared situation. Don't get yourself bit. You're not gonna be any service to the dog at all if you get yourself bit. Some common things that you can do, um, most dogs are leash trained. If you can put a leash on them, you may calm him down and have some kind of restraint control. Another thing to do is to cover the dog, at least cover his head, cover the whole dog. Use something thick enough that you can protect yourself. Uh, wrap him up, you can release a trap, you can uh, do first aid, you can do things of that nature. Uh, and you're not gonna get yourself chewed on and bitten up and make the situation worse. You're not gonna scare the dog off if you keep him somewhat just in a hug with blankets around him, take a sleeping bag, throw it over him, take coats or jackets, use a rain fly, whatever you've got. Look at something practical that you can do to help restrain the dog and get him to help. Um, if it's your own dog, don't assume, he's my good buddy, he'd never bite me. When they're scared, when they're painful, they strike out and they don't mean to. They'll come lick you afterwards and say, I'm sorry, but they can still do some serious damage. And then you're injured in the back country and your dog is injured in the back country and you've made things worse. So basically, the safest, smartest thing to do would be to evaluate the situation and um, according to whatever the situation is, try and determine the most practical way to get out of that. So again, my emphasis is on being prepared, be practical, and be practiced. Um, there's a lot of differences in different dog breeds. And again, you're gonna know your dog better. But you can do an awful lot of more advanced first aid of care for 
an old, and gold, an old golden retriever or a Labrador than you can a young German shorthair or a blue healer or if you happen to have a min pin in the back country or whatever, you got to know different personalities. And if you're going to find an unfamiliar pet in the back country, one of your assessments is what kind of personality this dog might have. And then you might be able to just talk him into, calm him down, do a lot of, of good um, care and first aid for him. You may realize this is a dog that's just at a high panic level and he lives his life with a high adrenaline level and all you can do is cover him up with a sleeping bag, carry him out and get help. So look at the overall uh, situation that you have and then make a judgment call, but be practical. As far as first aid goes for dogs, very similar to first aid for people with the exception of uh, anatomy differences. All of your wounds are gonna be covered with hair. You don't have that on skin. When you do splinting, everything's covered with hair and you have a very narrow tapered leg that will slide down in the front and a very angular leg that you don't have that doesn't straighten completely in the back. Uh, you have to take those things into consideration. We're going to start with the, the basic first aids. first thing you look for is airway. Uh, airway, uh, you have to see that the dog is breathing. But in airway training in people, you'd hold the mouth open. You could even put a stick in. You reach in and you clear the airway in the back. I'm not going to advocate that uh, any dog that you stick your hand down the back of his throat to clear an airway. You're going to end up with a chewed up finger that's that's way worse than and you then don't have a hand you can work with. If the dog isn't breathing unless he goes to the point of being unconscious you're not going to be able to practically assess his airway. You're going to have to do by looking and listening. You can't um, reach in and see. You might again calm old lab, you might be able to open his mouth and look and see. You might be able to get a forceps down there and pull something out, but I'm not going to tell you to use your fingers. Um, airway, ha uh, they have a uh, similar situation. They can choke. We sh uh, saw these uh, stranglehold things. Uh, airway compression can occur. Make sure that you clear the airway around the neck on the outside, but don't reach down for things on the inside. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, not going to work in a dog. You can't seal the mouth and it's got a set of teeth there. <laughs> if the dog is unconscious, you can use mouth-to-nose. They breathe exclusively through their nose. And you can get a seal and do a mouth-to-nose resuscitation, but only in an unconscious animal. And so assess, the, uh, you can see well whether the chest is moving, whether they're breathing. You can listen, um, make sure that there's air, but use some common sense and be practical. That long set of lips, you can't pinch it closed enough to get a seal and do a mouth to mouth. Don't try. There are people that do, but don't try, okay? The other thing I'm gonna talk to you about airway um, one of the common things that we see in dogs, especially in the summer, is heat stroke. And this is, you think of locked in the car. We're talking backcountry heat stroke. Dogs use their airway to cool down. You and I sweat. They don't cool down with sweating. They use evaporation from their respiratory tract. So they pant, but they evaporate a lot of fluid when they cool down. Dehydration shuts down their ability to cool down. And so you have to plan when you're going hiking, when you're going into the back country for water supply for your dog. You gotta pack enough for you and the dog or else be really familiar with the train, have checked out maps before, know that you're crossing streams, know that you're getting to lakes, know that there's water available. You can get dehydrated from sweating. The dog gets dehydrated um, from uh, respiration, you can still cool down. The dog loses his ability to cool down. Another an anatomical difference, we put on layers. We can take it down to bare skin. Dog can't take his coat off. He's not going to cool down anyway except for through uh, evaporation through his respiratory tract. He needs fluids. If you've got a dog that is continually panting, he's trying to cool down. It's time for you to take a 10-minute rest. Within 10 minutes of resting, 
he should stop panting, cool down enough that you can move on. If not, he's getting overheated. You've got to provide water. He needs the water to be able to continue to cool down. And we do see a number of heat stroke situations from people hiking with their dogs. Dark black dogs are more common and dogs will run and keep up with you and be happy until they run themselves to the point they drop. Person's gonna quit. We, you know, we're, we're either, either more common sense or we're just not as, um, we don't have the heart that they do. Um, but a dog will collapse from heat stroke just from hiking on the trail. If you start off the day, he's doing six laps compared to year one, he's everywhere. Midday, he's walking behind you. That's not his normal uh, position. He needs rest time, he needs um, water, he needs to cool off. So I'm gonna throw that in on the airway. Um, and the person has to be the one who decides the pace, the distance, and the availability of water. So that's something up to you. One of our next things that we always talk about in first aid is bleeding control. Bleeding control is another situation where you need to be prepared. You also need to be a little bit practiced and you need to be practical. You have a wound, there's a lot of blood, a lot of red go covers a, long area, a large area. It looks worse than it is most times. You need to assess it. It's covered with hair, you can't see it. You need to get down and part the hair. Is the blood pulsating? If it's pulsating, you need to spend some time and more effort trying to get pressure on it for, uh, to stop it and then keeping pressure on it, which is going to involve a bandage. If the blood is oozing and you have a cooperative situation, uh, you have good bandage material time, help, something, a bandage is a great idea. But if it's just oozing, you may be better off to just take your dog back and get help. If it's pulsating, you need to put more um, effort into stopping the bleeding. And it's surprising how many people bring in an animal and the blood is caked in the hair and it's still dripping down the leg and nobody's parted the hair to see what kind of a wound they have. Sometimes we get panicked people coming in and it's a little tiny cut. Sometimes we get people coming in, they say, oh, it's been bleeding for a while. We open, and it's a, you know, it's a major thing. <laughs> Um, take, take a minute and part the hair and look. And yes, on a short-haired dog, it's easier to see than on a long-haired dog. But take just the minute to see. Part the hair with a pour of water. Uh, whatever you need to do so that you can take a look at it. So bleeding control, the key thing is assess the situation. Pulsating, oozing. Cooperative dog, you practiced, you know he's going to uh, allow you to put a bandage on, put a bandage on it. Um, you haven't practiced, he's young, he's scared, he's panicked, it's just oozing, just take him in for help. And so bleeding um, is basically uh, the same thing in, in people. You do direct pressure first, then you put a bandage on to maintain pressure. When you put a bandage on, um, again, it will depend upon your situation. The optimum is that you have a nonstick pad that is sterile, with padding that will absorb and will cushion the circulation so you don't cut off the circulation. Uh, possibly even a stirrup on the back side of the leg so that your bandage doesn't slip. Then after you put on padding, put some gauze and then a vet wrap and you'll have a nice uh, secure bandage. The vet wrap is stretchy but if you've got padding you cushion your circulation and you don't, shouldn't have a problem with cutting more circulation off with it still having enough pressure to stop the uh, immediate bleeding. That's great if your situation allows that, if you practice with your dog, if your dog's cooperative. Maybe all you can do is one quick wrap with vet wrap. Still try not to take too much stretch out and cut the circulation from that point on down the leg. Talk a little bit about it when we get to, to trapping injuries, but a tourniquet effect that is on there for an hour, usually when you release it, blood supply can come back. If it's gonna be more than a couple of hours and you put on a vet wrap too tight, you have done significantly more damage and you might even cause uh, the dog to lose a foot because of a tourniquet effect. So you've gotta be practical. If it was just an oozing wound and you put on a really tight uh, 
elastic wrap, you have done more damage than good, and that's what we want to have you think about before and not do things that will cause more damage than good. And so um, the optimum uh, for putting on a bandage is you're going to take water and flush it over the wound, getting all the debris out, and by all the debris, I mean hair. Try and part the hair, flushing it out. I don't expect you're going to have clippers in the backcountry. I'm not going to advocate that you use scissors. We get a lot of uh, additional wounds uh, trying to cut hair. Just part the hair out of the wound. Add to your uh, um, first aid kit if it doesn't already have it. Most do a non-stick pad. Uh, carry Neosporin. I've, I've got uh, visual things here. The non-stick pads, they're Telfas, they're Curity, they're whatever. They're all going to be listed as non-stick pads. They come in different sizes. A Band-Aid is worthless. <laughs> a Band-Aid does not stick to the hair. It'll stick to good smooth skin. You can get big Band-Aids. They are not going to stick. You could still use the Band-Aid part of it if it's big enough as a non-stick pad. But a Band-Aid by itself is not going to be. That's great for your first aid kit, but you need something for your dog's first aid kit. So some non-stick pads. The next, if your dog is allowing it, you want some padding. You want something that has cushion, that absorbs. The purpose of that is when you wrap this snug, you can stop bleeding, but you don't cut off the circulation. Uh, you don't want to cut off the circulation for the leg down lower. Most of this is, is in the range, they call it leg cotton or uh, cast padding. It's just a soft, cottony stuff. It's not strong. It's just a soft cotton. It comes in bulky bandage names. It comes in names of, uh, this one's called cast padding. It's just layers that you can put on. If you didn't put this in your first aid kit and your dog is cooperative enough, just cut a towel in strips, cut a sweatshirt in strips. You might sacrifice some uh, clothing, but you'll get something that you can put on for padding. It will absorb. It will allow you to put on a good quality bandage. And I say cut it in strips. Just wrapping the sweatshirt around, the wrinkles, the bulks, it's not going to really do very good. You're going to end up getting it soaked in blood anyway, so you're sacrificing it. Cut it, cut it in three or four inch strips, roll it up, um, and make a bandage out of it. I've been rolling bandages since the time of Napoleon and whatever. Bandages go on better if they're rolled. So if you're going to take your sweatshirt or your t-shirt or whatever, cut it into three or four inch strips, roll them up first, then unroll it as you wrap it around the leg. Um, after you put on some kind of soft uh, padding, as I showed you, that doesn't have any strength. You want to put on something that's just a gauze roll. And someplace in here we have a gauze roll, but um, it's just gauze. Most of your first aid kits for people are going to have a gauze roll. So you want some kind of a gauze roll that you can then have some support or some structure on your soft padding. And then the final thing, um, I'm, I use the term vet wrap. There are, that was the company that came out with it first. It's, uh, this one happens to be Vet Flex. There are lots of companies that sell it. You can get it everywhere. You don't have to go to a veterinarian. It's self-adhesive, stretchy bandage material. You're prob most of you are probably familiar with it. I don't know. Um, but add some vet wrap to your first aid kit. It's great for people, too. It has one disadvantage. It's elastic. The elastic helps it stay in place. It sticks to itself. That's great. But if you take out more than 50% of the stretch, unless you have a lot of padding, you will cause a tourniquet effect. If you pull the vet wrap so that you can't see the bumps anymore, it is way too tight. If you take this vet wrap and you stretch it and you see it goes this far, come back halfway. Wrap it at half the stretch. You won't cause um, too much problem if you do that. If you've got padding between your vet wrap and your limb, 
you have a big layer of safety. Try and put some padding and then put a vet wrap on the outside. Vet wrap is moisture resistant. It keeps it clean. It stays in place. It sticks to itself. You can do a figure of eight pattern, which gives you a chevron look and really um, helps support and hold a bandage. It's good stuff. It doesn't weigh much. It doesn't take much room. You can throw it into your backpack and you can use it on yourself. So most first aid kits don't have vet wrap, but add vet wrap and add non-adherent pads um, so that those are in your first aid kit. So basically, the take home message is still be practical. If you've got an oozing wound, you've got a really panicked, high strung breed dog, going through a multi-layer bandage may not be practical. Put something on it if you need to stop the bleeding, something with enough security, if it's a pulsating wound, that it maintains the pressure that you put on and, and go for help. Shock is one of the other things that we always talk about in first aid. So we've gone airway, we've gone bleeding. We'll talk about shock control. You're limited with shock control. There are drugs that are helpful with shock. IV fluids are a mainstay for shock. You can't give those in the back country. Shock control is basically a matter of keeping the body warm so that the circulation stays at the major areas um, and uh, basically um, trying to stop any bleeding because blood loss is a major cause of shock. So we've talked about stopping bleeding. You want to keep them warm. Again, wrap them in whatever you've got. You know, if you wrap your dog in your coat and you're carrying him out, you're going to work hard enough. You're not going to need the coat. You'll stay warm just carrying him out. Um, but there's really limited things you can do in the backcountry about shock. In people, they talk about raising the, head, the feet above the head so the circulation stays in the trunk and the head. Don't bother trying to get your dog's feet above his head. <laughs> if he's at all awake, that's going to stress him further. Just keep him warm, get him to help, and stop the bleeding. Wound care um, is the, one of the next things that we want to talk about. And we sort of covered that with uh, um, stopping bleeding. And so I'm not going to go through a lot of that, but I'm going to throw in wound care pads. Uh, we see a lot of dogs that come in with abraded pads. The pad has sloughed off and they're down to the open red tissue. Most of the time, this is because it's an unconditioned dog going on a trip longer than he is conditioned for. And the owner thinks, well, this dog can do 10 times what I can do, so we'll just go. And the pad works sort of like skin. You've gotten blisters. I'm sure everybody in this room has gotten blisters. It's a common rub. There's fluid builds up between the skin and uh, the deeper tissue to protect the deeper tissue, and then it breaks. Um, so pad injuries can be sharp rocks cut them. They can actually get a cut in the pad. But many of the pad injuries we see are on multiple feet, which means we've had this dog keeping up. He doesn't complain. He just keeps going to the point that he has uh, developed rub situations that have separated his pad material from his deep tissue, and then it is sloughed off, and he has these large open red sores that he has to still walk on all the way back. The key take-home point on that is your dog needs to be conditioned. Dogs that run on hard, rocky surfaces get tough pads, just like people who go barefoot all the time get tough feet. And people who always wear shoes like me get blisters. Um, if you hike a lot, you know you'll get blisters early in the season and you won't later. Dogs the same way. Show some consideration. Take some short hikes first, then go for the longer hikes. They make dog booties. Dog booties are a, a really effective at both prevention and somewhat effective at getting the dog back after he's already gotten pad slough injuries. But you have to buy the booties beforehand. You, you're not going to make those. So you got to have dog booties that fit your dog. If you know you're going to be asking him to go in really rough, rocky terrain and he's not conditioned, at least have him wear booties when he goes. Or have booties along so that you can put Neosporin in them and help him get back. Um, so 
as far as wound care, I think we've covered it. We want to flush out the wound. We want to get all the debris, including the hair out. And we want to be practical as far as how uh, clean we, we make the wound. This is the back country. We're going to flush it with water. When he comes into a veterinarian, he's going to have a surgical scrub with saline solution, thoroughly cleansing the wound before it's permanently closed. If you want to do a little more thorough job, that's great. Um, you can carry a little betadine, a little null of sand. You can scrub a wound and disinfect, uh, uh, help decrease infection significant, significantly by doing something of that nature. Saline is definitely easier on tissue than water is. You can make saline with a teaspoon of, of salt in a quart of boiled water and let it cool and use that. But for practical purposes, pour water over it copiously enough to get the debris out and call that a clean wound. It's not going to be a permanently closed wound in the backcountry. So I'm going to advocate that you're practical about it. Um, there are some people who are going to want to uh, do a, a little more, and I have no problem with you carrying betadine, Novasan, Oxydex, Fizahex, uh, any of those uh, deep cleansing um, wound care things to, to clean a wound first. Okay, we're going to talk next about stabilization of fractures, but first that sort of brings us into, I guess, the overall topic of today, and that is uh, trap injuries. In a veterinary office, we see trap injuries, and I have to say, in almost 30 or over 30 years, the trap injuries I've always seen are on the leg. My impression of trap injuries were uh, um, extremity injuries. I saw the slides today. I see there are choking industry injuries and I see there are crushing injuries. My suspicion from this is those choking and crushing injuries don't make it to the veterinary office. Okay? And so we're going to uh, primarily talk about um, injuries to the extremities. Same bandaging pr principles that we've talked about. In addition, and, and with a, a uh, trap injury, leg hold traps, one of the more common things we see is actually damage to the blood supply. And damage to the blood supply may not show up right away. You may be able to take the trap off and see minor abrasions and the leg looks good. But if that trap was on there over a couple of hours, the cells downstream from that trap injury have started to die. They didn't get any oxygen for an hour or longer. And if they don't get oxygen or if the blood supply deep is damaged so that they can't get oxygen, seven to 10 days later, you may see uh, a, a leg that has to be amputated. And it can take several days to show up. So constantly evaluate any kind of, um, whether it's cloth got twisted on your dog because he was tied up in a blanket and it cut off the circulation and you came home and found him or he, his foot was in a trap. Evaluate it continuously. If you have a leg that is cold after you remove the trap, that's a bad sign. If you have a leg that still feels cold an hour after you remove the trap, that is a grave sign. And many times you'll get a foot that starts feeling warm again. In time, it ends up uh, actually you lose the foot. So that's one of the things that you have to be aware of with <laughs> trap wounds. The other thing that we do see in spite of the comments that uh, uh, trap wounds don't break legs, we do see broken bones. And so I'll talk about fracture uh, stabilization. I've been given the uh, cue that I need to wrap this up in just a few minutes. So I'm going to talk about some different types of splints. To do a splint, you have to do a bandage. On a dog, you have to pat it first. The splint is the dog's going to have motion. There's going to be more rubbing. A person will lay still more so than a dog. So you have to pad your splints. You have, uh, air splints are common in the backcountry. You can blow them up, but the hair covered, tapered leg of a dog, you have to use just the arm shaped ones and they tend to slip. They also puncture with the first bite. Air splints aren't as practical on your dog as they are on you. 
lightweight, easy to carry. They're still useful. Um, the leg-shaped ones are not going to be good, and the arm-shaped ones are not going to be functional on a back leg. So you need something that's more versatile. And what I'm going to recommend is that you do some kind of a SAM splint. They're really lightweight. They're aluminum padded. They come in different kinds. They have padding, different sizes. Uh, they're cuttable. They come with a user's guide to, to shape it for each and every structure of a human body. They don't shape for uh, a dog unless you know what you're looking for. So I brought, brought some quick splints that we use in the clinic. And just to show you, now you're not going to carry these with you in the backcountry. The reason you're not is because each, they come in multiple sizes for every size dog. You could pick your size dog, but they have a right front, a left front, a right <laughs> rear, a back rear, and you have to use the correct one for that dog. This one happens to have four legs, but there's a right front and a left front, and they're different. And so what you're going to do with your SAM splint is you're going to sort of try and look at this pattern and cut, and you can do two layers to fit the size of the dog. This is a small dog. You know, obviously you want it on your, do your size dog. You want to put the bandage on first because that's going to make the leg thicker. And then you cut and fold your splint to, to fit the front leg. We have them for the back leg. You got to do right and left again. And human splints don't come in that shape. <laughs> and so your SAM splint is cuttable, shapeable, and foldable. You can make one that looks like this. If you can remember that shape, that's great, but you'll actually, if you follow the pattern that your dog is giving you right there on his leg and make it fit his leg the way his leg is shaped, you'll make a SAM splint that works like this. We have metacarpal splints. Again, there's padding, they're straight. You can do the same thing with a SAM splint. So if you're going to carry splint material, I'm going to advise that you get the SAM splints. And they're, they're sold and made for the American uh, Red Cross for people. But those will work on animals. You have to pad it. You put a, a heavy multi-layer padded bandage first. You put your SAM splint on, and then we got the vet wrap again. You put the vet wrap over to hold it in place. There are situations where you're not going to have a SAM splint. You can use sticks. You can use tent poles. You can use rolled up newspaper. But you have to be cognizant of the shape that you want to splint the dog's leg in. You don't want to just do it straight on a back leg. When do you want to do a splint? Optimally, any fracture should have a splint. But you also don't want to do more damage wrestling your dog, putting on this multi-layer bandage and then putting on a splint if you don't have to. And so if the leg is dangling because of the fracture and it's swinging free, you really want to try and put a splint and stabilize that. If you have a leg that used to go this way, now it goes this way, and so it's angled, uh, has any kind of angulation to change, you really want to try and splint it. But you want to splint it in the angle that it's in. You don't want to change it back to the way it's supposed to be. So you, again, your SAM splints or sticks or tent poles or whatever you're using, splint it the way the leg is when you find it. Pat it first. There's going to be a lot more motion and rubbing. You don't want to do more damage than good. And if I Got a minute longer. Um, okay, we'll just quit there. Um, what is your suggestion for a dog in the field that gets hurt as far as pain control, like with aspirin or anything? There isn't any pain control that's going to be quick enough. You can have drugs like Rimadyl with you. It's going to take half an hour to 45 minutes to work. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's sort of like uh, uh, stronger than ibuprofen, but an ibuprofen for people. That brings up ibuprofen, acetaminophen. Um, you know, those drugs are not safe in a dog. Aspirin can be given once or twice. 
doesn't have a lot of uh, potency, but you're probably not going to have uh, strong pain medication for yourself either when you're in the back country. And so unless you have a, uh, you know, a prescription for a narcotic, you're not going to be taking that yourself. And aspirin's probably the best you've got. Aspirin is okay on, a, on an occasional basis for your dog as well. Yes? Um, you said that you see leg hook uh, injuries in mm -hmm. your practice. Would you mind sharing approximately how many you see a year? I can't give you an actual number. Um, I saw a lot. I practiced in Libby, uh, Northwest Montana for uh, a little over 20 years and it was a solo practice. We had a lot fewer clients coming in and I saw more there than I see in Missoula. Um, but they, they do happen in Missoula as well. Yes? Where do you get those SAM um, Any place sells first aid supplies. Can I make a recommendation? Yes. Um, there's a company in town called Area Backcountry Medicine. It's a school that teaches wilderness medicine. They have every single item that he's talking about. They're on... Um, First, second, fourth, fourth street, um, down on the river, along the railroad track, off of Higgins, down from Big Pizza, Pizza Place, Pizza. Down the road, the road ends at a cul-de-sac. They're in the very last building down there. They have all that you can buy, onesies, twosies, dozens. It's called Airy Backcountry Medicine. They teach wilderness first aid, A-E-R-I-E. So if you want to take a class too, for, for people. Everybody should take a first aid class, yeah. at least. And you can apply a lot of it to your dog. Are you going okay, to I've run, first aid class? I'm, <laughs> I'm not uh, qualified to train it. So um, actually, you'll probably need to take a first aid class for your person and then be practical and think about how to apply it to uh, your pet. Okay, and I guess I'm running out of time. So thank you. Thank you. Now that this whole thing's cheered everybody up, um, basically, I'm in the same frame of mind as the doc was as far as being prepared. Um, I don't leave the house without a hip pack. It's right next to my dog's leashes and collars. The dogs don't go out of the house without this thing on me or my wife. In here, I carry a strap for opening a conibear bear trap. other things as well but I, and I also carry cable cutters these can be purchased at a, any um, bicycle repair shop and they're specifically designed to cut cable wire cutters leatherman bolt cutters all those things they'll cut cable but they won't work in this situation um, okay there you go oops Just not strong enough, like a needle nose to try to get underneath yeah. that. Uh, needle nose won't work. You can't. I'll explain in a second here. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's do the let's do these first. The snare. To me, the snare is probably for people walking dogs. This thing is really dangerous. Probably one of the more dangerous ones. Um, leg holds will grab a leg and they'll they'll break a bone, but they'll hold an animal. These things are said. You can see in the pictures when Tim was showing. They're set up in pathways, a dry creek bed, uh, an, aura, an animal run, a deer run, a deer path, anything like that. And what the hunter will do is he'll range the size from what he, or about what he wants to catch, but it's pretty indiscriminate. He'll put it like this. He'll block up all areas around it. The animal's got to go through. And even if he is going through not fast, the animal's instinct is to go through. When they get caught with something, their instinct is to pull and pull hard. The harder you press on this thing, the tighter it grabs. It does not let go. The only way you can let it go as a human being is to pinch in there and it will open. But no dog is going to be able to do this. The bad problem is if a dog goes through it at a full, gal at a full speed, full tilt run, by the time this thing stops him, he has yanked his neck really hard, harder than you'll ever be able to do with a leash. And you could just, he'll just, it's going to cut a lot of air off fast. Um, the best thing to do with these, now what happens is, when this thing bites in, with, to answer your question about needle nose and that, you've got a dog with fur and a fat lining, so this cable, by the time you get to the dog, is already, you can't see a lot of it. The thing with these is, they're blunt nosed, and they're also angled. So you won't have to go in far. 
And when you press on them, it channels the cable right back to the, to the, uh, to the highest point of tension, and it will cut them. And if you can see, this thing doesn't even have to go in a half an inch. So you can just jab this into the dog's body, again, you know, with, onto the cable, and cut it. And it works, because I've had to do it. Um, it's really, it's, I, to my mind, this is one of the more dangerous ones for people walking dogs. If you can pull it off, all and well. Off, but, but this thing, is, it's not very big. Here, now you pull it. You have your dog. He's running at a full tilt. He's got himself caught in one of these things. I don't know about your dogs. My dogs are very well behaved. My dog got caught in one of these, and he was not very well behaved. He flipped. You know, I've you know, got a 100-pound dog now flopping around like a fish out of water. The first thing I did was I jumped on top of him and stopped him from moving. The second thing I did was I took my cables, my cutters, and I cut it loose from its attachment point. He still has it on his neck, but I'm on top of him now. So once, and, once, and once I can cut this off attachment, even if he's moving around, he's not gonna tighten this anymore. And then I went in and took it off of his neck. Do you know, that, do you know right away, like if your dog is off and you, you come upon it and it's thrashing, can All right. you see this? You could possibly see it. Here's my the point I was just gonna bring up. If you're walking your dog in an area, in, the, in public lands or anywhere, you're gonna have to do yourself a big favor. Do not let your dogs out of your sight. If they do go out of your sight, constantly call them back. Constantly see them. A dog can get, through, go and get caught in one of these and not be able to usher a bark. So the only thing is, if you can't hear him and you can't see him, he's flopping around. So that's why it's, you, you know, unfortunately, because we are, in a way, by 0.4% of the population, held hostage on our public lands in that, you can't just mindlessly walk through the woods with your dog and figure that he's going to go off for an hour and come back and find you. Don't do it. Stay eye contact with your dog. If he does wander off, call him. Make him come back. It's not a bad practice anyway. Um, it's, it's, it varies. It, it varies how, you know, how thick of a neck, how fast was he going. The bottom line is the time you have um, should be as little as possible. You know, this is not, this is strangulation. It is a really bad way to go. It's slow and it's painful. Um, yeah, please, Tim. One, um, uh, Ted's idea of cutting the cable loose from its anchor point first uh, was okay because he was on top of his dog. Yeah, yeah well, that, that's, that's where I was going. You never, you never catch, you've got to have control of your animal. That, and that's the first thing, I, when you grab him, I mean, I, my dog, I took my jacket off, I threw it on him, and I put my entire body, all 208 pounds on top of him. And it was not easy to hold him down. So you have to have control of your dog. Even if you have to throw your leash onto your dog, get control of the dog. He cannot break away from you, otherwise he's leaving with this thing on him. Which is not good, but it's better than being attached. All right, that's the other part of it. So, yeah, you have to have control of your dog. Um, you're going to dig a set of those cutters, I mean, sort of frantically into your dog's neck, mm -hmm. which you may have to do, in, in general terms, just in consideration of anatomy, you're probably going to be safer on the back side of the dog's neck. You have fewer vital structures. And you have yeah. a great gear, you have large mates. The only, the only good part about it is that this, if you can see, they're blunt. There's no point, there's no puncturing, there's nothing. You can just, you know, you can just shove these into an animal, it's even yourself, and it's hard. It'll pinch, you know, but it can't pinch that much. Uh, I'm, on, I'm the, the opinion, there's a cut there. If I cut my animal's skin three-eighths of an inch to get this thing off of his neck, I'll deal with a three-eighths of an inch cut. I just watched the first aid thing, so now I know. <laughs> now I'm cool. Um, oh, listen there, yeah, please pass it around. Anybody, else, anybody wants to see it? Go right ahead. There's more, there's a few more on the table over there. Um, yeah, a lot of people, and people don't even exist that they're out, realize that they're out there. And they are out there a lot. Um, where my dog got caught, it was, in a, um, it was in a dry creek bed, and he found the one, and within, within 100 yards, I found six more in the same creek bed. That's illegal. Did you cut them all? It is illegal to destroy traps. It's illegal to destroy them, and it's illegal to remove them. They're private property. On public lands. On any lands. 
It is private property. It is illegal to dismantle or remove traps. Okay? I'm just telling you, those are the laws. So, I mean, granted, when you get your dog, I mean, in circumstances, technically, cutting that snare off of my dog was illegal. Of course, you know, you, but you report it to the FWP, you know, people are not going to be crazy and try and charge you with a crime for that kind of thing. But you can't go around and remove traps. All right, the next one. Yeah, please do. We had a um, uh, very avid supporter now. He had his dog down by the Bitterroot River. He was a golden retriever. And he thought his dog had found a mouse. The way it was yes. jumping and flip hopping around. By the time he got over to it, it had been caught in a snare and there. Mm -hmm. um, and even had he had cutters, he found out afterwards the damage to the esophagus, yeah. you know, as it's running down and going to the river, mm -hmm. it was. That's why I'm saying do not. Don't, if you see your dog, you, you stay in contact, you stay in constant sight of your dog for the most part. But if you see your dog acting strange at all, even if you think he's got a mouse, go check it out. If he's acting strange, go check it out. It takes you a few moments to go see if the animal is okay. And if he is, if he's got a mouse, then that's, that's, you move along. The next one of these is the leg hold. Um, now this one, I think we may want to Maybe spread some things out here. And you people, may, people might, might want to stand up to come and see this. Leg hold traps. Um, usually, you'll find they'll also be, a lot of these will be baited. And even if they're not, they're put in certain ways. They'll either be put in a path, and they'll be put in a path where um, there's a trap and there's bait. And then there'll be a trap back over here. If this one goes off and doesn't get him, it's going to spook the animal. He'll jump to the side. There's a tree. There'll be a trap there. Or he'll jump to that side. He'll be a trap there. They'll put a few traps around. Because if one goes off, the animal's going to panic and move. Or they'd like, to, you know, a trapper would look more than be happy to get him in one or two traps. The simplest, th these, um, they're the pretty much simple to open. Your animal's in there. They're, it's, as far as that, it just basically, you're, be, the thing I want to tell you right now, if your dog has stepped on one of these, I don't care how well you and your dog get along, there's a real good chance when you go near this foot, near your dog, you're going to get bit. This dog is going to be flipping. He's not going to be a happy camper whatsoever. So the, the, again, like with the snare trap, um, immediately gain control of your dog. Because also, you don't want him flopping around because it's just going to do more damage to his leg and the bone and you know the fur and the meat around it by just yanking and pulling. So get a hold of your dog. And if you have to, jump on top of him. A coat, a sleeping bag, your partner, whatever. Jump on this dog. Hold him down. If he's well behaved, if he's well behaved, just put him between your legs. Hold him. Basically, you want to just take these things and you want to step on it. You can step on one sign. Then you can step on the other side. Once you step on these sides, it opens freely. It'll fall open. There's nothing involved, all right? So you just need to step on the sides of these, and these will open, all right? So this is the easiest ones to open, no tools involved, and they'll fall open. Can you do it with your hands? Or you, you can do it with your hands, but the thing is, if you've got your dog, you can hold your dog and just step on these. You can do it. If you have a, if you have a partner, um, you can, if they're holding the dog, you can use your hands and just push down. I mean, you, they can be done. It's not, you know, I'll just get back here for a second and I'll show you. They're not hard. It's a, I mean, I'm not using any strength whatsoever. I'm just leaning down on it. So they fall open. So they're really simple to open and really simple to get your animal out of it. Um, oh, yeah, you let go, it will snap back. You know, it's definitely once you get your animal out of there, get the rest of you out of there as well. Um, well, no, yeah, you, well, no, once it's open like this, the only way to lock it down is to set it again, which takes more time. And I think if your dog gets caught in one of these, you're not going to really want to set it again. That's, that's, that's just an opinion, so. Um, the next trap is the conibear trap. 
That's what this is. This is a smaller version of the Conor Bear trap. They all work in pretty much the same, same principle. These are the springs. There's safety on them right now, so nothing can happen. What happens, how it's triggered is the animal will go through. Ooh. <laughs> Got your attention, didn't it? All right. Because the safety pins are on that, it doesn't, it doesn't snap down with its full force and it doesn't lock open. But that's what happens. And the uh, trappers, what they'll do is um, they'll gauge, a lot of them will bend. They'll bend these wires to, probably, to help dictate what animals will get caught in them and won't get caught in them. You know, if I bend these wires up, it'll be a smaller animal that can get underneath them. If you leave them down like this, you know, any small animal is going to trigger it. All right? Um, uh, yes and no. Any of these, I mean, any trap can be baited. You can put a snare trap with bait behind it. So any trap can be baited. It's, it's entirely, there, you know, there's no, I think with any of these things, there is no real uh, way, whoever, who's ever tra doing the trapping, they're going to decide what they want to do. Um, so if we find it, is it going to be stand, standing up on a side like that? No. Or? Yeah, well, it, yeah, for the most part, yeah, it'll be, it will be set like this. This is how it works, and this is how it's going to go off. Okay. Um, of course, anchored. Uh, oh, we're going to use uh, Fido here. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Not as much. As, on land and in water? Or in land and water. Yeah, land and water. They're primarily used, um, they were, uh, for the most part, they were um, invented as a quick kill because people complained a lot about, yeah, yeah Fido uh, here. <laughs> Sorry, bud. Um, they were designed originally actually for beaver, and they would be put submerged at a beaver's entrance. He'll go through it, get caught in it, and drown. It'll hold him under, and then it's a done deal. And then they, you know, they don't have to kill him afterwards. So a, well, I guess it's a little easier for the trapper. Well, yeah, right, exactly, so they can rest a little bit. Okay, so we're going to take these off. All right, that's a conor bear trap. This is going to be real noisy. Excuse me, just one second. I'd just like to mention to people that the legal use of this trap is underwater. It is not exposed above ground. So if you ever see a trap like that and it's tagged, you need to turn that information into the fishing game so that trapper can be fine because that is an illegal set and um, you know it's supposed to be completely submerged. Yeah but the problem is that a lot, okay. some of these trappers aren't doing it legally. We don't need to Okay okay we, you know, we, we, can, we can go on this like Tim said for days and we already have gone on for years about this all right the bot the <laughs> so the thing is that right there now you saw the pressure that came down with any animal you know this, this is not going to be a good scene for any animal you can well, I'm going to show you right now how to get them out There's a real good chance, if, if, but for, judging from the size of your animal, judging from the size of your animal, um, if it gets caught in one of these traps, there's a real good chance it's going to be dead. I can take the other one off. That, that's, that, that's all right. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a witness protection program. <laughs> and I'm from New Jersey, so this is like, it's not a far cry. Yeah. Well, please do. My name is Anja Heister. I'm the executive director of Foodless Montana. And I just wanted to know that um, uh, a carnivore bear trap was actually the reason, actually a dog who died in the carnivore bear trap, Cupcake was his name, uh, was actually the impetus for us to get started as a non-profit organization. And that trap was set illegally um, along Rock Creek just outside of Missoula. Just along, you know, that very popular hiking um, trail along the along the creek. You know, 
know, Cupcake died and Philip, his owner, had no idea what happened. What happened you know? And that's why we actually came up not only with starting our nonprofit organization, Nonprofit Martina, but also that's why we thought there was a need for us to show and to learn, to teach ourselves too, about, you know, how to do these travel, these workshops. But, but so that's why we're doing what we're doing. Since the trappers need uh, the ability to check their traps, that you, it's almost like you're more likely at a trailhead to have a problem rather than farther back. And I think that's something, mm -hmm. to me, that was really enlightening to me because you, the if you're trapping, you want the ability to check your traps rather efficiently, so you're more likely to run into problems at a trailhead. So you may want to keep your animals on leash for a little while if you're going on a hike. Jackie, you're actually bringing up a good point. Something we haven't mentioned yet is actually the trap setbacks. And so legally, it, it, it is legal to set traps 30 feet from the center line of a public road, 50 feet from a public uh, trail. Uh, Non-lethal snares or black hole traps can be 300 feet away from uh, trail nets. And lethal uh, snares and uh, carnivore traps can be set 1,000 feet away from the tra from trail nets and campgrounds. Which for whose dog is metal. Exactly, yeah. So when you're out there, when your dogs, make sure you bring a tape measure. So you can tape all this off. The problem is, an illegal, a legal trap will catch your dog just as fast as a legal trap. Yes. Point in question. Are there any incidences of children? Not yet. Not yet. I guess that's when the law will change. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, here's, unfortunately, this is not a fast, um, a fast process. This is nylon strap. You can get... Okay, yeah, I'm real fond of it. <laughs> it's a nylon strap. It's called webbing strap. It's used for climbing. You can get it at any outdoor store. I I like it rather than people say you can use a belt. You can use um, other strap. I like it. It's smooth and it slides real easy. And when you see this, you'll know why I like it. Basically, you put the palm of the strap through the two rings. The two large rings that are on the spring, right here. It doesn't matter what side. What side? You're going to have to do both. Oh, okay. This is a pro that's why I say this is not a fast process. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you have an animal that's in this thing, you know now you know why. Yeah. Going on. Is it safe between your legs? Is it safe between my legs? <laughs> I'm not going to have any children, so I'm cool. <laughs> what you're going to do, I don't know. <laughs> oh, wow. Jeez. Oh, I see. So you're pulling on the dog's head while you're trying to. Uh, oh, God. That would be hard to do with a dog trapped like that. Mm -hmm. And snowing. Mm -hmm. The best thing to do is get rid of trapping, okay? Yeah. 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 Possible. The recommendation too is to turn the head to alleviate some of that pressure across the, the trachea. There it is. Oh my God! You have to get it all the way back until. But but you might not have you might not want to leave your dog. Do you know if any dogs are Well, if I can't top my head, I can't tell you. It's not easy, obviously, because I've done it a lot of times, and it slides all over. It doesn't want to cooperate. There's a report that will go on our Facebook. But I'll do the other side and show you again. Page, and there's a dog that um, a gentleman was hunting rabbits, a beagle. And he said that his dog was caught in one of these, a smaller one, but he got it off and he gave him... Um, CPR for 15 minutes mm -hmm. to save the dog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the trick is to figuring out and getting it off quick enough. And he's the only dog I've heard of surviving one of these. Yeah. Oh, 
No, no, it didn't trip again. I just did the, the piece flopped over. All these things are real good reasons to keep an eye on a dog. And the smaller one opens the same way. The old, yeah, the tiny bears all open the same way. Did you ever, hmm? you ever use the technique where you anchor one into your foot and pull? Yeah, but I seem to, I seem, I, I kind of like this one better, obviously. <laughs> Well, I can't get it on there right now, but that's how you open it. You have to do both. So then will that piece just pull off his neck? There's the one. So how now how you can show say the rest of the How do you even get their head out of the Yeah, because this one might crooked. And it's gonna take something to get it back. <laughs> You can't buy a cutter that's big enough. No. We're taking off the torch. Oh. Because it's big. Just ask for the Not this These these can be cool. Small ones can be manipulated by hand. But even then, it's not easy. So they can be squeezed in. I can't even do it by hand. Stake to the ground. Well, just be staked to the, to the ground, tied to a tree. However, however the, the, the trapper wants to you know, fasten them in. Does anybody have any questions? Same way. It opens the same way. See the little, the smaller one. If there's two people, two people, one per, if you can get this open. If there's two people, because one person can squeeze it. And then somebody can try and flip it. So you can't possibly use two people. It's still really hard. How you look at it. 
This is this is a leash that's made out of webbing, similar to what Teddy had has used there. Um, it already comes with a ready-made loop on one end, which is where you're holding your hands. Um, and, and the idea, and these, these are not terribly intuitive. So Teddy knows what he's doing with these. It's kind of hard to watch and, and figure out everything that's going through his mind. The idea is to compress these two ends of the one of these springs together. Okay, and believe me, you're welcome to come up and try to do it by hand. Uh, it can't be done without on these large ones. Um, so Teddy had a, a, a different technique he used. The one I like that gives me more leverage is to take your dog leash that you hopefully have with you, loop one end around your foot and anchor it. Anchor your foot out in front of you. And then you want to run the turn aside. Yeah, you want to run the leash twice through this thing. Okay? And one other thing with this, to do yourself a little favor. Move this thing as close to your foot as possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that when you are pulling back, you're not using so much of your arm strength as you are going to use body weight. Okay. And so now with it like this, I can pull. I'm pulling pretty hard, but I'm not the strongest guy in the world. And then at that point, you've released some of the pressure. And if not, you've hopefully got enough adrenaline pumping <laughs> to get that on place. So if it was just you, you would have to pull and, and, and do it. So now you've got one side loose, and now you got to move over and get the other side the same way. At least that takes some pressure off that one side. Not a whole lot. A, a little bit, maybe. No, not a lot. I mean, it's not... Getting one side of these is not going to take... is not going to do any great refreshing or comfort for an animal. And if you encounter one of these that has these... Uh, well, I don't know why they would have the safety tabs removed. And no, no, they won't. Yeah. They can't, they can't set them then. Oh yeah, that's true. There's no way to do this. There's no way to set it without the safety tabs. And then... Are you more likely to run into one of these smaller versions? You're more likely to run into anything. Okay. <laughs> that's, you know, the doc was saying, you know, if you're going to walk your dog out of the woods around here, but honestly, okay. be prepared yeah. for anything. Yeah. So be prepared so for the worst. Same way again. Yeah. Oh, Back of the foot. Yeah. Oh. Are there areas that are worse yeah. than other areas? No. no. You, you, you can't safely predict. There is no, you know, there is no, you, you can't, the mindset you need to have is this. When I take my dog out in the woods, I'm going to incur, I'm going to incur a trap. Simple as that. If you think you're going to incur a trap, you'll be prepared to incur a trap. If you go out, you don't see a trap, you come back. You know, there's. I've had this stuff, I've been carrying this stuff for over two years. I've used it once. But once was enough. I would have lost my dog. So once was enough. So, I, you know, for the effort, money, and time involved in carrying this thing for two years, it's a pretty cheap price. So just then when you were doing it, you, you needed him to do the latch to knock it? Well, he I, could, I, I he could've, he could've, could've did it, but I mean, it's, I, I, it's, yeah. hard. it's hard. Right. It's hard, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, anybody doing this, this is not easy. This is, I mean, you're gonna have adrenaline going, you're gonna have a zillion things running through your head. So it's it's the kind of thing where you almost have to like sit down and calm down and get the round out of this thing. Okay, well, who wants to? Yeah, absolutely. You guys want to try it? You want to shot? You spring this? Sure. Yeah, then no problem. So, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least it's the same basic material Teddy has. I, you, can, you can get a smooth braided nylon blanket that's falling off. Um, basically, anything that you can do for it, for it, after it's sliced, it will slide and it will work. So, that's why this is nylon web. You want to trip that thing? Yeah, no problem. I can't stand it. Alright. Here you want the yeah, give me that cardboard too. Nice. <laughs> I have tripped it from my hand, I'll tell you that. I can't I can't stick quite on it. Oh! 
Well, right there, you can see pretty much what it'll do to a eight inch thick cardboard tube. Okay. The thing is, you want the foot on the other side. And also, too, the thing to, the thing to check out. Make sure you have it to be down. Yeah, let me, um, give me this big one. I'll set it off. Okay. You can try and take one and try and do it. All right. I'm going to set it up and I'll set it off. You want to be crouched down on that side. Yeah. Leave this one here. What's that? With a 30 pound dog guy and a heartbeat. It'll break his neck. Well, I hope you put the seat with any of these though. It all depends how the animal goes in. If he goes in, you got here, here, it's, 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 it's all arbitrary. So, this. Thank you.